Um, so good morning to everyone and I think even good afternoon to some of you. I, I know that we have even participants from India. I'm happy uh, to moderate this uh, panel. The title of the panel is The Role of Corpora for the Study of Language Use and Mental Health Conditions. Uh, and I, I should add that I am a moderator and I tried uh, helping, I helped to organize this uh, session, but I sh would also like to thank Francisca here because uh, she was also very active in uh, uh, getting this session done and, and, and getting a, a wonderful um, uh, team of uh, expert uh, panelists uh, together. Um, yes, let's go to the next uh, slide then. So um, the overview of, uh, of this panel is I will give a brief introduction to, uh, to the matter. And then we have two minute presentations by our panelists. So these are the, 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 the experts that we are happy to, to have here. Uh, Gloria Gagliardi, Stefan Goetze, Satonino Lutz and uh, Keith Strong. And then we uh, have a floor opened for question and answering. Um, if during uh, the presentations, uh, uh, even these short pitches, you already would like to pose questions, please go ahead and use the chat for that. Um, and then we go to the next slide and uh, I will give a brief introduction to, uh, to the topic. Um, as we notice this, uh, this research into traces of mental health condition is really booming these days um, and, and attracts lots of uh, researchers. Um, um, for example, in uh, Interspeech, we had a, a, a special session uh, in which uh, Satonino was also uh, very heavily involved with the Adresso challenge. And I think he, he will address this uh, as well in his, uh, his, his own pitch. Uh, but it, it really shows uh, uh, the, the, the vibrant uh, nature of this, uh, this uh, topic. And it is uh, vibrant in many uh, aspects because it's, uh, of course, it's, it, it's, it's a real challenge to, to see if we can find such mental health conditions directly from such multi multimodal streams of speech, text, and video. But we also see aspects of uh, data uh, collection and protection uh, when it comes to the vulnerable people that are mostly involved in such uh, research. So when it comes to collecting, processing and sharing these data, uh, uh, special caution and, and uh, uh, protection has to be um, uh, safeguarded. Um, and another aspect, of course, uh, very health, uh, heavily involved here is how to avoid biases in software and tools if you develop something and uh, things go into the wrong direction or give uh, false alarms or false negatives, false positives, then uh, what is the consequence of that? And it, it, they may be heavy and have a great impact, uh, more than uh, the data collection itself. So in this panel, we will have a, have a look at what the role of clearing can be in, in facilitating this type of research from an infrastructural uh, perspective. And so I'm happy that we have our four panelists uh, here. So if we go to the next slide, um, then, um, I would like to uh, give some brief indications of what Claren is already uh, working on. So it is possible to, um, to, to, to um, share data on a restricted access uh, basis. Uh, um, Claren has licenses for that. Um, Francisco already mentioned the DELAT initiative where we really look into how we can share this type of data involving uh, vulnerable people and atypical speech and we organize uh, all kinds of workshops uh, on the topic. Uh, we addressed this yesterday as well in the bazaar and in another session um, uh, in the teaching where we have a, a GDPR um, uh, educational module uh, developed by uh, Dela. And also in the shock project in which also Claren is heavily involved, we look at ways of how to share this type of data, perhaps in alternative ways as we know it now, uh, um, um, like typical download options, perhaps other options are also possible and needed, um, who knows. But before I would uh, uh, go to all kinds of topics that we could address here, I think it's better to introduce the panelists first and to have their view on what Claren can do. So let's first go to uh, Gloria. Gloria, um, if you go to the next slide, I think uh, I can give you uh, the floor. Good morning and thanks. Uh, to the organizer for inviting me. It's a big pleasure to be here. Uh, well, in two, in two minutes, 
My research activities mainly focused on digital linguistic biomarkers. In other words, the detection of pathological conditions, such as, for example, mild cognitive, mild cognitive impairment and dementia through the computational analysis of verbal productions. Um, my research group worked a lot on cognitive frailty in the past, in the past years. But at this very moment, we are also working on anorexia nervosa and uh, neurodevelopmental disorder, in particular on autism and um, DLT. Of course, uh, this task requires require the collection and the annotation of spoken and written corpora. Um, we also developed lexical resources and database and language tests to support Italian speech, la speech and language therapists in the, profiling the, in the profiling of communicative skills of their patients. In my opinion, Clarin could enhance future research in this field in two ways. Firstly, it can provide legal advice on the collection, the storage, and also on the, the sharing of this special category of personal data, according to the European regulation. I mean, um, I would like to share the corpora we created in the past and the corpora that we are going to, to collect in the future with the scientific community, but our ethical committee is very strict on this point. Maybe in the future we can negotiate different conditions with the help of your legal platform. Given this picture, the second point is the findability of the resources. And I'm convinced, <clears throat> sorry, I'm convinced that Clarin can enhance the visibility of this specific kind of corpora and database. To conclude, at the moment, I have more questions than answers, and I would like to explore the opportunity to combine the ethical requirements of data protection with the possibility to share them. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Well, well done on time and the very clear oh, okay. uh, presentation. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much. OK, let's go to Stefan Götze, who's presently uh, at the University of Sheffield. Yeah, good morning also from my side. I don't know if you can hear me. Um, so I did some, some uh, projects in my past and also partly in the present on, on um, machine learning for pathological speech. And uh, of course, that uh, needs a lot of data. Uh, I, I started with that topic in 2013, and then there was, uh, yeah, the situation was even much worse than it is now uh, with the availability of, of corpora. Um, so I did some work on uh, automatic speech recognition for uh, atypical speech, also for assessment of these speech signals uh, uh, on the one hand side in terms of speech intelligibility, listening effort and quality. So how good is the signal? And uh, once you have done that, you can uh, also develop training systems. And that's what I did. Um, um in terms of yeah uh, developing um uh, if if you have uh, if you're treated by a speech therapist and uh, this is not high frequent enough you can benefit from training in between uh, and what are the exercises you you should do there and of course corpora are uh, important there also multimodal i would like to add uh, um, eeg um, signals to the list we we saw before um, but uh, I, I really like uh, to see the DLAT initiative. Uh, that is something which, which is very important in my opinion, and also to make people aware that um, when they ask for, for consent by recording corpora, they should, um, if where, where, wherever possible, um, um, keep in mind already that this data is very, very valuable uh, beyond their direct um, uh, target. Okay, that's maybe enough for me. Good, Stefan. Thank you very much. Okay, then we go to Saturnino. I already mentioned his uh, involvement in the ESO uh, challenge, and I think he's going to say more on this right now. Saturnino, the floor is yours. Hello, hi. So yeah, I, I, I missed the, the very beginning of the presentation. I couldn't find the the, the, the link, but. Um, um, so uh, essentially, this research that I'm, I'm doing overlaps with um, with the research has been described before by Stefan and um, Gloria. So it's a research on speech and or language as distinct uh, sort of entities for the 
for the use for the development of biomarkers or digital biomarkers for neurodegeneration. Uh, so what kinds of data can we use in this case? We can think of all sorts of data situations in which one could collect speech, for example, dialogues or narrative speech. Um, we've already used uh, resources facilitated by Clarin, uh, namely the Dementia Bank. Um, the existing resources um, have a number of limitations. Uh, one of the limitations is that they're not enough ex existing resources, of course. Uh, the other one is uh, biases uh, related to the collection and availability of the data. So Dementia Bank is highly imbalanced in terms of um, of gender and age, which are major risk factors for dementia and that affects uh, modeling. Um, comparability of results, we have a lot of different approaches. We've done a, 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 a systematic review of this area, found a lot of different approaches, but the results are not immediately comparable because we don't have uh, benchmarks. And uh, also in terms of the data quality, so there's a number of challenges. Uh, I just put a, 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 a pipeline on the uh, right-hand side showing some of these challenges in pre-processing the data and making it, uh, putting it to a format that is suitable for comparisons. Uh, we attempted to address some of these challenges. We created these challenges called Address, uh, which we run at Interspeech using subsets of the Dementia Bank. And uh, I think that uh, the, the Clarin uh, infrastructure could help in terms of increasing availability of uh, uh, neurodegenerative disease um, speech and language data, maybe incorporating these data, such as the ones we used in the, in the challenges, um, creating other data sets uh, that are suitable for, for such things, and maybe providing a basic layer of software infrastructure that will standardize some of the pre-processing that I mentioned. Um, another issue as well is that for this type of research, um, there's just a, a sort of a limited amount of usefulness of the speech and language data if you don't have the underlying clinical phenotype. So if you don't have um, other biomarkers, medical records, progression, other things. Um, and last, there's the privacy issues. Uh, the data protection issues that have been mentioned before. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Satanino. And I think it's also very good that you pointed out to uh, one other uh, Clarin uh, uh, data center, uh, which is uh, um, headed by uh, uh, Brian McQuinney, uh, the talk bank, the dementia bank at CMU, where indeed uh, there's also uh, data available. Thank you for pointing to that as well. Um, so um, let's go to Keith Truong, um, based at the University of Twente. And um, well, we look forward to uh, your contribution, Keith. Hello, good morning, uh, everybody. Um, my, uh, my main research interests are in uh, computational paralinguistics. So I look at nonverbal aspects in speech communication. So think of uh, detecting speaker characteristics, such as uh, someone's uh, social emotional state or uh, mental state or physical state. So you can, for example, hear that I have a uh, normal cold in this case. So apologies for my voice. Um, but so those are the kinds of things I'm interested in. And in this context, um, I'm interested in um, looking at speech as a biomarker for mental health uh, conditions. <clears throat> um, in the recent years, we've been uh, collecting uh, multimodal data from uh, older adults. And the idea was also to collect uh, data from older adults with uh, dementia, but that didn't go through because of the COVID situation. So um, we do have a, a corpus um, with uh, uh, older adults' uh, speech and also uh, facial expressions. Um, we, we asked all the adults to uh, recollect happy and sad memories. Um, so you can imagine that these, uh, we've collected very uh, personal stories. And um, while all the participants, well, most of the participants gave their consent, uh, we sort of were um, 
um, yeah. So the the main the the idea was to uh, have this corpus uh, publicly available, but in the end we uh, didn't make it publicly available because we sort of wanted to protect the people, the participants themselves, uh, because we thought the the stories were very personal. Uh, so um, you know we thought maybe it's not that of a good idea to make it as publicly available as we wanted to in the first place. Uh, but but this is something maybe we can discuss uh, also in the panel. Um, I had some other points uh, that I wanted to raise. Um, I've noticed that there is a lot of unused data with uh, clinicians. Um, so um, I've been working with a psychologist who has access to a lot of old uh, uh, tapes. Um, and I wonder, uh, you know, these are all tapes with uh, clients um, uh, with uh, depression. And um, yeah, I wonder what we can do about that uh, or what Clarion can uh, do about that. Um, and the other uh, question I had was about um, what uh, do we already know about the clinicians uh, use uh, and, and how they would use the tools and, and what their needs are. Good. Thank you, Keith. I think you really uh, um, dropped the problems uh, very, very clearly, and uh, as also the other panelists did, uh, because the first uh, question indeed would be, um, so you have collected your uh, materials, and how were you able to, uh, to share these? And uh, well, we already saw what the limitations were, were and uh, maybe I'm going the way back to, uh, to the panelists to say how they were able to make their data shareable or not, or what the hindrances were, were to have that have a clear idea of that. Uh, and you had a very interesting point, Keith, where you said we did have the consent, everything was there, but we ourselves thought it was too personal. Uh, and that, that is, that's a limitation that is very in interesting because uh, there you say oh, we wanted to protect the, the data subjects themselves, uh, although we could share the data. Uh, and that was even you could not make them uh, available on, say, a restricted basis, uh, so to speak. Yeah, so what we did now is, um, yeah, if you're interested in the corpus, well, we have the corpus on site on campus. And if you would like to make use of it, you would have to come to campus to look at the data. Um, and we do have the features available, I think. So those, I think, are, uh, you could use them. But if you really want to have a look at the audiovisual data, uh, then the raw data, you would have to come. Uh, visit us. So uh, you have a safe, uh, safe room where this can be done. Something like that, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, that poses an interesting other question, perhaps because if people could approach the data at your site, but having a say a desktop solution where this could be possible, so that they need not go to physically to go to your site, would it also be something you would consider? So the data would not leave yeah. uh, your building, so to speak. Uh, you mean uh, whether that's te that's technologically possible? You think? Well, well uh, whether you would agree to such a solution, and then the technology is the other uh, thing. Uh, yeah, I think the main point is that we, yeah, indeed, want the, the data to uh, stay in the building, uh, and yeah, uh, with remote access, I'm I'm not sure if you then know what will happen with the data, but also if people, you know, approach. If people on site uh, have access to the data, you also are not really sure what happens with the data, but I think you have a better, uh, I guess you have a better view on it. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. This was sort of a compromise, you know, we don't want to make it uh, really publicly available. But we do want to share the data, so yeah. And this was a sort of a compromise. Exactly, exactly. So that's the dilemma again. Good. Uh, Saturnino, could you uh, say something about sharing uh, the data that you have, or in the address of Um So we are pretty much um, um, constrained by the same constraints as everybody else uh, regarding privacy and uh, use of the data and uh, GDPR regulations and so on. So we've. Um, we use the dementia bank because one of the great advantages of the dementia bank is that it's it's available it's easily 
shared um, and for the for the tasks for the for the challenges we were more interested not so much in developing an application but in in, in comparing different approaches to to detection of, of dementia so in that, in that for that context the dementia bank uh, data were were great and um, and they, they are actually great because there, there are other um, uh, clinical information available together with the speech data, which make it very interesting. But it was not collected for for language for speech, so the, the quality of the recordings is, isn't great. Uh, we have other corpora that we've been collecting and um, and um, sharing in a limited basis in connection with a different project, and this is a corporate of dialogues. Um, the the way we usually share things in in Edinburgh that. Uh, uh, relates to patient data is through what we call a safe haven. There is a there's an infrastructure that's been created, so people apply for for approval. So there's a whole ethics uh, approval process, and then there is a, an approval uh, to join the safe haven and to get access to it. Uh, so access is either physically, so people go to a to a room and uh, they get access to to the data there um, but now increasingly because of covid 19 there's uh, there's remote access as well through um, um, uh, through the desktop to a secure platform that's <clears throat> de developed for for this purpose uh, there are restrictions of course you can't take data out so you can't put import much into the platform so it's not that seamless process of developing models, doing modeling that you'd find if you're working on your own data, but it's it's better than, than nothing. And it has the advantage that the safe haven is for the National Health Service. So you can connect the language data to all the clinical information that is available through the National Health Service, including even uh, social care data and other things, if you're interested in, in that kind of stuff. So all you need to do is put together a request for these data um, and, and request specific uh, data items for your specific project. And, uh, and that's usually granted within a certain amount of time. It's not- Feltonino, is it also possible from, for researchers outside Edinburgh or the UK uh, uh, to, to um, uh, use such, uh, uh, say, the safe haven you're talking about? I believe it's it should be. Um, I mean, they'd have to go through the same uh, approval process that uh, researchers in the UK go through, but I don't see why uh, it would be restricted. I don't know exactly what the regulations are, but uh, yeah. I think it's it's not limited to to researchers here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think the remote secure access option is an interesting one. Uh, which is perhaps also interesting for for Claren to investigate. We do this yeah. already in the, in the in the shock context, but uh, to see all the options that are already available, that that's good. Oh, let's go to Stefan now. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, maybe I I, um, I tell you something about what what were the failures in our recordings in the past. So with the first projects we just recorded for our purposes. The first project was on uh, um, automatic speech recognition for atypical speech. So we got some data from some patients. We trained our systems, what did not work so well, but the data was basically lost afterwards because it was tailored to this problem. And then for the next um, corpora, we uh, try to make that, um, yeah, more that we can reuse the data. So we, we spend a lot of work on uh, thinking about what data, uh, how that could be balanced yeah, on whatever word level, phoneme level, sentence level, what are the possible um, application scenarios we, we did not have in mind by then. And then the key point uh, is informed consent. And for me, um, a collaboration with clinicians um, or experts, uh, uh, clinical experts, which explain to the patients or subjects what happens with the data. So we um, we went for an opt-in um, possibility. So first, the patients were asked uh, for this project, for this research project, the one we were working on, is it okay that we use the data? And then there were two additional opt-ins uh, 
are they okay um, that it is used for future um, research and are they okay that it is shared with other researchers? Unfortunately, we did not yet publish that. It's, it's running more slowly than I, I want to, let's say it like that. Um, but we um, the, the goal was and still is that it is publicly available also for other research questions afterwards and explaining what happens with the data uh, is was the key. Uh, so basically every, um, every patient opted in uh, that it is okay for us to, to publish that afterwards. It's just a matter of time. <laughs> yeah. And, and then Fraunhofer would be able to give the, uh, the protected uh, data area where it can be shared. And, uh, yes, there is no heavily personalized data inside. So of course, speech itself is, that's a debate uh, uh, we have all the time, is speech itself already personalized? But uh, we didn't ask for names. Um, but we have, uh, um, that was for, um, um, yeah, so, so uh, it's, it's not yet really sure how much of the uh, clinical assessment we will provide in addition to the data, but at least there are simple scores uh, um, which, which can be provided in addition to the data. So yes, the, the, the plan is to make most of the things we have available. Good, thank you. Okay, let's go to Gloria. Thank you. Um, we were just talking about the Italian legislation during the social morning cafe and the Italian, in the Italian law is very strict on this point, so we cannot share our data in any way. Um, maybe it's time to start a discussion at, in, it, in Italy with our colleagues to, to find a way to Yes. share our data because it's very frustrating to collect <laughs> materials and uh, mm, not be able to, mm -hmm. to share mm -hmm. in any way. Yeah, so, so here you also see that the implementation of GDPR in various countries very, very much differs, right? Um, so I could advise you to talk to Silvia Calamai, maybe she's sure. here, uh, because she is really go going making steps in this field uh, and, and, and uh, making good progress, I think. Um, yeah, yes. but indeed, this, this is uh, a clear problem also in, it in, in, Italy, in Italy and other places. I would like to go to a question from the audience, uh, John Nermont, Nermont, sorry. Um, so he says, um, um, it's a great topic. The need of corporate intelligence management is clear. Can you say something about what benefits for patients might be possible in the near future? Um, so uh, what, what is your research meaning for, for the patients? Uh, because I think, uh, I suppose it's an important motivation for, her, for them to, <laughs> to, uh, to participate in your research. Um, so can discrimination be improved? Uh, so this is the positive aspect of discrimination, of course. <laughs> yes. Who of the panelists would like to react? Yeah. Lisa, I can uh, uh, comment on the first thing. Um, so often you cannot promise uh, the participants that there will be direct and immediate benefits yeah, because you, you, you do not know it's research. Um, but what we did is we showed them demos we, um, we developed in the past. So for example, the training system for, for people with uh, speaking disorders uh, for the more high frequent training. If you say, this is an outcome of our research in the past, uh, um, we cannot promise you something immediately, but um, see that we work on, on, on topics which might benefit even if it's just the next generation or something like that. That is, that is con or was convincing uh, in the experience I had. Good. Others? Saturnino. So, yeah. Um, so in terms of, um, of, of the Alzheimer's uh, research that we, we're doing, so Alzheimer's, there's obviously no cure for Alzheimer's. So there is a debate as to whether it's even useful to diagnose a person with Alzheimer's and tell them that they have Alzheimer's that it's going to decrease their quality of life and uh, you know and there's no no real treatment at the moment but uh, increasingly as, as treatments are becoming available there is a, a tendency to to try to diagnose as early as possible so these people can be 
it's not treated at least enrolled in clinical trials. So they have been offered the, the option to, to be enrolled in clinical trials. So that's uh, a potential benefit. Um, the use of speech and language in these contexts is, has advantages because it's, it's a cost-effective way of, of doing cognitive testing. It's non-invasive. Uh, so the, currently the only reliable uh, method for early detection of Alzheimer's is uh, a lumbar puncture CSF analysis. So cerebrospinal fluid analysis, which is very invasive, expensive. The person has to go into the hospital etc. Um, and the other approaches are standard cognitive tests, which means that the person has again to go to a clinic, do a test, and these tests vary a lot. So maybe the person didn't sleep well the night before, they don't perform well, uh, and they have a ceiling effect. So there is a, 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 great, a great deal of interest in, in methods that can uh, track the, the, well, not only diagnose, but track progression of disease. Uh, to be used in conjunction with the treatments that are appearing now and to select people for clinical trials. So these are the, the more immediate benefits, I think, of, of this type of uh, technology. Yes, thank you. Uh, other panelists would like to react to that? Or shall we go to another question? Um, so, because I, I noticed that um, some of you also mentioned the enormous potential of clinical data now residing in hospitals. Um, so, what could Clarin do, for example, to to um, make such data available? Um, one thing, of course, we, we we should know is if if this data recorded for say a clinical purposes can be used for research purposes as well. Uh, and that, that's perhaps the first question. And maybe panelists can react to this or and uh, say a uh, legal expert from the audience, I see a couple <laughs> could, could react to that. Yes, if I may. Um, um, <clears throat> I was just writing the, the, the answer down to the question in the chat. Um, actually, it, um, uh, well, let's start with with uh, the good news. The good news is that the 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 CLIC, the uh, Claren Legal and Ethical Issues Committee, has uh, an increasing number of uh, highly qualified legal experts, including from Italy. Uh, we have our committee has been joined very recently by um, an experienced data protection officer from an Italian university, and we are very much looking forward to uh, working with him. So we can address specific uh, legal context in Italy. We can do it for a number of other countries, the Netherlands, uh, Germany, uh, but and, and others, Lithuania. Estonia, many others actually, but still far from, um, it's far from all the Claren countries. Uh, and um, I think I was, uh, I once attended a workshop of another project, uh, the legal issues in another project, and it was brought up to our attention that uh, even if it is possible to compile a list of uh, specific regulations per country, a specific norms per, per country, uh, device a tool or, or a, a set of guidelines that would address national specificities, then uh, what would really be difficult is to maintain it because it would have to be periodically reviewed, not by one legal expert, by, but by at least one legal expert uh, per country, which um, generates and then what they did in this project was they were really asking for uh, legal advice from attorneys uh, qualified lawyers from each country which would generate uh, a really huge cost so the the, the cost of maintaining was uh, over uh, over uh, five to ten years would greatly extend the cost of creating this resource now the advantage of Click is that uh, well, Click is obviously free, uh, but for now, Click doesn't cover um, every uh, the Click's expertise doesn't really cover all the Claren uh, countries. So uh, we will be very happy to help you as far as we can. We can do 
it seems quite a bit for Italy now, uh, but um, Apparently, I can I... only I can only invite other uh, national coordinators to uh, uh, send us new members. Uh, <laughs> uh, of course, and it will be for the benefit of uh, of Claren and uh, the whole language community and the whole yeah. um, uh, um, disordered speech community as well. Thank you. But could you, but could you also say something about the availability or making available clinical data? for uh, for research but uh, would that be a matter of repurposing or would you say no no that that could be legally uh, uh, well well possible to do that uh, well the use of uh, as uh, esther has already pointed out i think that esther would be more competent to answer this uh, question specifically but uh, generally the gdpr uh, when it comes to sensitive data leaves uh, quite a lot of leeway uh, to national legislators. So it is the area, these are two areas. Uh, so sensitive data on the one hand and research on the other that are largely left uh, to national legislators in the GDPR. And uh, well, research on sensitive data is in the middle of these two uh, groups of issues. So uh, I uh, think that it is extremely um, country specific. Uh, in the countries that I know of, uh, there is uh, a possibility to share um, uh, health data, clinical data for research purposes under certain conditions, of course, uh, but I, I really cannot vouch for, for other countries. I, I admit I was quite surprised to discover that in Italy is uh, not possible at all, uh, but yes, well, um, um, this is how the Italian legislator decided to organize uh, things. Uh, uh, I, I know from ESTA that in the Netherlands, uh, things are better than in Italy. Uh, luckily for the DELAT uh, <laughs> yeah. data, which are hosted <laughs> as far as I understand, yeah. are hosted yeah. in the Netherlands. Yes. yes. So that may be uh, perhaps a way around. Uh, so if the mm -hmm. processing takes place in one country, then it follows the national Rules. Yeah. Okay, thank uh, you very much. Oh, yes. Uh, there is a chat comment in, uh, uh, yes. by Esther. Uh, that is, uh, if you scroll back, you can. Okay, a legal it. perspective on the problem yeah. in Italy, yeah. right? The problem yeah. is also that the GDPR mentions derogations for research, but leaves it to member states to put them into national legislation, right? So that's done, this is, and the GDPR is not general enough to harmonize for research, yes. So a role for click, but you pointed this out as well, uh, Paolo. Thank you very much uh, for that. And there's also a, a comment from Dominic Lukes. Uh, what I find missing in discussion is examples of forms of case law. So um, what, 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 um, uh, how, how do yeah. judges uh, interpret and uh, decide in actual cases, if there are any? Uh... <laughs> yeah. May, may I uh, say yes, something about that? Yes, yes, please. Um, yeah, because because that is uh, when we look at uh, uh, the GDPR and uh, accountability and enforcement. Uh, of course, uh, there are not many cases because the supervisors recognize that the the derogations for research and public interest in research that research is important. It needs is to comply with ethics standards. And um, I learned over the years that it is important to uh, maybe think more about what kind of checks and balances are in place in the ethics process to think not only about uh, harm to humans, but also harm to data and uh, training ethics boards on that. And I. Uh, recognize that, for instance, uh, on artificial intelligence, this summer uh, for the uh, uh, ethical self-assessment in European projects, uh, very good guidelines were devolved, uh, evolved, uh, developed and made public. And that's 
they are so helpful in in giving examples of cases where there is a high risk and uh, and that's uh, um, I think uh, an approach to a harmon a more harmonized approach can be um, built upon the the ethical uh, frameworks more than on case law because there will not be much case law in this derogation for reu uh, for research. Yes. <clears throat> Can I ask, uh, because yeah. we are running uh, uh, yes. uh, towards the end of the slot, um, uh, if everybody who has recommendations for steps that Clarin could take, and not only in relation to the sensitive uh, aspect of the data, but also uh, in terms of low-hanging fruit uh, uh, support that we could offer for, for this field at large, maybe if it's about public text with signals for how to say that a community uh, mental condition or uh, uh, examples of patient groups that are eager to uh, see that th their data are being shared, etc. That we get recommendations for how Clarin could uh, improve on the service offer for this large domain or for subdomains of this large and as Hank said, vibrant domain. So um, maybe we will um, include a short a survey element in the questionnaire that will be sent out after this conference for people who are interested in following up on this because we will also plan to uh, organize for example a cafe on this specific aspect of sensitive data good thank you for this addition i think that's very important so there is data already out there which we can use and for we, we do not know about so we would like to know uh, what data is there and what we can use. And the other thing is how can we support you in making the other data available where you see uh, the difficulties and so on. So within Daylight, we are now working on say a pipeline of saying uh, starting from data collection, but also with consent forms and so on towards sharing the data in a repository, what steps to take. Uh, and I hope this will also help you. We hope to publish this uh, by the end of the year. Um, uh, so that will be another aspect where, where we hope to, to help you. Uh, and I think Click also has an important role here that's, uh, that's evident. Um, okay, uh, I think um, it's, uh, it's almost time now.